as I said, I'm going to be talking about the microeconomics of security. And I think what they mean by that topic is sort of applying economic analysis to the industry of providing security. And it's not, much of what I'm going to say today is not dependent on Austrian economics per se, just any sort of economist who understands free market principles could at least understand the arguments I'm going to make, whether or not he or she would, would be persuaded by them. Um, there are a few points that I'll, um, and I'll try to remember to indicate where, that the things I'm going to say, re you really would need to be familiar with Austrian economics to, to fully understand the subtleties. Uh, it is true, and I, I should probably clarify in case some of you are fairly new to this circle of thinkers, Austrian economics is distinct from libertarian theory, but in practice it happens that um, many current Austrian economists tend to be very radical libertarians and, and vice versa, but they are distinct enterprises. Nonetheless, today I'm going to be mostly talking about what you would probably think of as an application of libertarianism. So let me just go over, these are major sources if you're interested in this sort of thing and want to read more. Uh, the writing is kind of small, but you can check it afterwards. You can't see from where you are. So for me, I still think, and in, in my own personal evolution in these uh, areas, Rothbard's For a New Liberty, his chapter on police and judicial services, um, I still think it, you know, it's, it's uh, very reasonable. It's hard to uh, disagree with him. Even you, know, you can give it to your parents, and they would say, okay, he means well, and he's just a little bit naive maybe, okay, but he doesn't sound like he's crazy. Uh, the Market for Liberty by the Tannehills is another one. The Machinery of Freedom by David Friedman. Now, the, these three things, depending on what your philosophical views are, one of these would probably be more persuasive for you. So if you're a natural law theorist, then Rothbard, you know, that's where he's coming from. If you're an objectivist, follower of Ayn Rand, then the Tannehill book would be, you know, that's where they're coming from. And if you're a utilitarian, then the Friedman book. So that's so he's in other words, he's going to be making arguments that, you know, aggregate efficiency is going to be, or the you know wealth will be maximized under these sets of rules and police doing such and such. Whereas Rothbard, of course, would say something more like, oh, by natural law, this is what's just, and so the police in my ideal world would be doing this sort of thing. Okay, um, and then so these are sort of classics. And then this is, I'm sure you've seen it all over the place, The Myth of National Defense, edited a collection of essays by Hoppe. And this is available, in case you don't know, it's online in PDF form, so you don't need, if you don't want to buy the hardcover, it's available for free. And then last, but certainly not least, um, this book, Chaos Theory, is something I self-published when I was a punk in graduate school. And the... This is the attempt here was to sort of glean all of the pragmatic and compelling to you know normal people arguments from these three without committing myself to either natural law objectivism or utilitarianism. So that um, because it seemed like for a lot of the arguments they make here that they didn't need to you, you know cite their objectivist or natural law principles that you know everybody kind of knows that yeah prisoners shouldn't be raped in prison and you don't need to first prove that you know life is the ultimate objective and that a reasonable person would would seek after life and then deduce you know we shouldn't have rapes in prisons okay you don't need to go through two chapters of objectivism to to reach that so that's um and so that's you know whether or not the objectivist with a, with a big o um is right or wrong. So that's that's what I was trying to do here. And then I also had somebody do some artwork, in case you can't tell, these are um, feather pens and this is a rifle and this is like the anarchist A. So that I was trying to like show people that, um, you know, anarchy's cool guys, come on. That was the, the intent and it, I think maybe four people agreed with me. Um, <laughs> okay, so that that's this. And then this is um, Minerva, which is a, a novel that I recently finished, and again here I had to go the, the independent route that I couldn't even get. Okay, so you, ultimately I wanted to get it published. Not only couldn't I get it published, I couldn't even get an agent who would be willing to read it. 
let alone say, yes, this is a good story. I want to, uh, to mark it. So I, it, it ran in serial form on Strike the Root. And, uh, at this, and now after it has run its course, um, the guy running that put, put it on. It's available in PDF form. And so if you want to go to it, this is a little bit funny. It's sort of like if you went to the, um, the lecture where they were talking about the calculation problem, how the, the Soviet plan would say, you know, you need to produce X number of kilograms of, of, of nails per month. And so rather than doing what we would normally think of and making reasonable ones, they make, you know, really huge nails and so forth. In the same way, the agreement I had with this guy was, okay, and after it runs, can you have a link to it from your front page somewhere? And he said, sure. And so there is a link, but you have to go to the right and scroll way down, and it's this tiny little word Minerva in hyperlinked, and that's where you click on to get to the, um, to be able to access this in PDF form. Okay, so anyway, depending on, oh, and let me make a disclaimer, this has adult situations and strong language, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Machinery of Freedom on Dave Friedman's site, all free and all oh. HTML. Okay. All of it? Uh, for a while, just some of it. I think he's put all of it up now. Also, okay. on, on my website, there are a bunch of links to zillions of sites with more of this stuff. So my site is praxeology.net. Okay. And during your lecture, you could write that up. I don't know. I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that's just some background. And again, just depending on where you're coming from and, you know, if you feel like reading a novel first just to have a nice story. If you're thinking, I don't want to waste my time with fiction, I want to get into the, to the good stuff, that's where you should perhaps turn first. Okay, um, let me make a distinction before we get into the specifics <coughs> that a lot of people, they try to t take on too much they, when they first start out in this area. And so if you're, if you're talking to a normal person and they say, you know, you say, I think that we ought to have, the government shouldn't be providing police services, okay, they're, they're going to automatically assume that that means, which is also true if you're an anarchist, but they're going to assume that the police and law and, or justice are linked and that, you know, it's sort of a, you can imagine someone making the claim that, oh, whoever, whoever runs the organization that sends armed people out is the law in any given society, okay, this whoever, whoever controls the police uh, makes the rules or makes the laws. De facto, okay. You can see that being very like, real politic view, and that anyone who thinks otherwise is naive. But actually, I don't think that that's true. I mean, it's certainly true in a sense, but I don't think that it's very helpful to to look at it that way. And I think we should distinguish between how are the legal rules formed and how how do we or how is it determined to keep it passive? How is it determined? You know, who which people are criminals and who needs to be arrested and so forth, who is guilty of, of a crime and should be taken into custody and so forth. And then as a separate issue is how are we actually going to implement that? Okay, so in principle you could believe, still believe in a, a, a government monopoly on the definitions of laws and the determination of who criminals are and so forth, and then the police would just be um, private, just in the same way that the government right now determines um, how many bombers are going to be built and so forth, but it's not a government actual industry or company that produces those things. Okay. Now, what, so one reason to make the distinction is just so that you don't, if you're trying to make the arguments I'm going to make in the rest of the lecture, you don't get bogged down into people's distinctions and, and arguments over what the just legal system is going to be. Okay. So you, the point here is I'm, I'm offering this as a strategic recommendation that if you're trying to argue with somebody about whether government should monopolize police forces or not, it's, you know, you're, you're taking on more than you need to if you're also at the same time trying to argue that the government shouldn't be involved in the definition of law. Just to make an analogy to, so you can see the point, you could take that very cold-blooded, realistic view that, oh, whoever controls the police defines law, and you could say, oh, whoever publishes dictionaries gets to define words. All right, and so yes, in a sense that's true that Webster's, the people who put out the, the, the dictionaries are the ones who type in, okay, this is what the definition of Apple is and so forth. And the people, if they argue over what's, what is the meaning of serendipitous, and they go, let's go look it up. And so whoever typed that in and printed that book, in a sense, is the one who defined that word. But if you had competing 
producers of dictionaries, which we do have, then you can understand how any individual firm that deviated from the widely accepted norms would quickly go out of business. Okay, so if somebody put out a dictionary that where serendipitous meant, you know, a very unfortunate sequence of events, then, you know, somebody would, would make fun of that and laugh at it, you know, uh, David Gordon would write a review or something, and then the, the people in the know would know, okay, those guys are morons, we're putting out that book, and maybe they would sell a few thousand copies and mislead some people, but after a while, they would go out of business, because the whole point of buying a dictionary is you want to be assured that this is the codification of what scholars generally agree is correct English, or whatever language we're talking about. Okay, so it would be, in my view, analogous in a an anarcho-capitalist society where one group of individuals would be the ones, you know, scholars in the legal arena and so forth, and theologians and those people would be all be interacting with each other, and they would determine what the body of law is. And again, we don't need to get into that because we're going to get bogged down with disagreements, but if you're a Rothbardian, and you could think, yes, that there would be a group of scholars who would be applying the ethics of liberty and would be writing on issues and so forth, and then there would also be judges and arbitrators. <coughs> and so when people had disputes, so just to, to illustrate the distinction between the police and the, and the judges, so if, if I, someone, I think, stole my cow, okay, the first thing I would do is I would go and report it, and then if he, if he denies it, then we could perhaps go to an arbitrator. Okay, and I would say to him, well, I challenge you, let's go present our sides of our, let's the, our cases to the arbitrator. And if he denies it, if he says, no, I don't want to, well, then that's going to be a signal to everybody that they don't, uh, that this guy's probably hiding something, okay, because there are going to be people in the arbitration industry who everybody knows, oh, those guys are fair, okay, because that's the way they're going to get business. And you know, if, they, if they have a, a bunch of cases where, people are bitter afterwards and they tell their friends about how, yeah, he suppressed this bit of evidence or he took a side payment from the other, from the other uh, party to the, to the lawsuit, then people aren't going to keep going to those arbitrators. So the idea is there are going to be individuals who have reputations for fairness and justice. They might make mistakes, you might disagree with their rulings, but it's going to be an honest disagreement. Okay? You're not going to suspect their integrity. And so back to the case where I think somebody steals my cow, if I challenge him and say, let's go to this particular arbitrator that the community knows is a, is a fair guy, and he says no, well, then he must be afraid of something, because if he really is innocent, then he should trust that the, the rules and so forth that this arbitrator uses when he lays out a verdict, everybody knows, okay, those are designed to, uh, to convict in guilty men, but that there's a strong uh, safeguard in there for people who are innocent. And, and then, of course, you could say, all right, well, then you name an arbitrator, okay, because it wouldn't just be one person who has a monopoly on uh, legal rulings. There would be com competing ones, okay, and so then if he, if he picks a name that everybody says, well, who's that guy? We never heard of that arbitrator. It's his cousin or something. Well, then I could, you know, justly say or defensively say in the eyes of the community, well, no, not that guy. Pick somebody that we've heard of, okay? And so the idea is in normal day-to-day -day operations, with regular people who live in communities and have to bump into their neighbors at the store and they go to church and they don't want to be embarrassed by you know, people thinking ill of them, you can see how most people would be going to arbitrators and then the arbitrator would make the ruling and then let's say he says, okay, yes, I do think that you stole the cow and so you owe um, Mr. Murphy, whatever, $5,000. And then at that point, if he doesn't pay me, then perhaps I would call on whatever agencies there are in the society that provide security services, okay? And so if you do, if, if the laws do allow for the fact that someone who has a pending um, debt to somebody else, a fine or so forth, and they're not paying it, then at that point it's legal for armed individuals to go to this person's house and say, okay, we're going to come in and just start seizing property and sell it off and pay off your debt, you know, that, that sort of thing, okay? So it's not that the, the companies... <coughs> who hire these, these men who are trained, you know, they're expert marksmen and they have body armor and so forth. These companies are not the same group of individuals who also determine which people in society are we going to send our armed agents out after. Okay, whereas with the government, of course, those two functions are merged into the same apparatus. All right, so that's um, one distinction I wanted to make up front. And then for the rest of the lecture, I'm not going to talk too much about the, 
the legal side, I'm just going to assume that there is a, is a way that we've determined who the guilty people are, who the criminals are, and so forth. And now we're just going to look at it from an economic analysis on the, the side of the companies engaged in the protection or security industry. Let me um, clarify one other thing in case you're going to be confused. I am going to be talking today just about a positive economic analysis of this industry without bringing my own personal value judgments. So if you went to the, my talk two nights ago, of course, I'm personally a pacifist now. I wasn't, incidentally, when I wrote this. It, um, I probably would have had a gun on the cover if, if I had been. But it, the, the analogy I use is that you know, I can certainly talk about, let's, I think the government ought to legalize drugs, and here's what I think would happen in the cocaine market. Okay, and then you know, dealers would do this, and addicts would have this, and this would happen the price, and so forth. And I do morally think it would be better if the government did legalize drugs, even though I still would object to somebody being a cocaine addict. Okay, and it's the same thing in this realm that I do think the government ought to legalize um, competing police services and so forth. And even though in such a world, I personally would never pay a firm to go, you know, kick in somebody's door and have guns blazing and take back my cow. Okay. Um, so the next point I think I should make is that even, even in my remarks so far, I've sort of contributed to this misconception that we really ought to uh, break the habit of thinking like this, that the, the agency that provides safety and, and security in society is the, the official police agency. <coughs> All right, and that's really not true, okay, that in terms of what actually gives day-to-day -day security, it's you know, things like locks on your doors and, and um, private firearms in, in, your, in your home and so forth and uh, guard dogs and alarm systems and things like that. And then things you might not really normally think about, but, for example, if you, certain apartment buildings, if you want to move in, you first have to be interviewed by a group of the other tenants and if they don't like you, if they think you're a shady person or you're, you're not married or you don't go to church, they, they have the right to, to not let you move in there. Okay, and the same thing in certain um, sub-developments and so forth. If you want to buy a house in that area, then actually there's all sorts of rules that you have to follow or else they'll kick you out. And so one of the, the reasons for that is they don't want somebody moving in who himself is a criminal or who hangs out with a bad circle of friends and that, you know, if your next door neighbor, his buddies are coming and going and they happen to see one time when you're coming home from shopping and your door's open and they see that you've got a plasma screen TV and so forth, well, then they're going to start plotting to, to break in and so forth, all right? So to keep those t sorts of people out of the building, that's one of the functions of these associations. And so this stuff is all things that actually do promote security, that they reduce the amount of crime and so forth. But certainly the police has nothing to do with that. And I, I think that this is really what provides the bulk of security in society um, or just things as obvious as parents teaching their children, you know, don't talk to strangers and, you know, don't ever be walking out at, late at night by yourself, things like that, that just in terms of day to day, that's what keeps you out of the harm's way from criminals more than relying on, oh, if I'm ever in trouble, I'm going to call the police, all right? And I think that would even be true in an anarcho-capitalist society. Okay, so the, the point of me stressing that is just to remind us that we should try not to fall into the habit of thinking it's the police that keep us safe. Okay, but having said all that, now let's just analyze what would, <coughs> what would it be like in an anarcho-capitalist world. <coughs> and so there would be competing firms and what they would be offering their services professional security personnel okay so they would if you're a, a, a owner of a mall or you own a bank or a jewelry store or you're a store and you have a huge parking lot and you've got you know perhaps uh, single women shopping and they're going out late at night you don't want them to get attacked in your parking lot because that's not good for business and so what are you going to do well you're going to um, you know maybe if you, let's say it's a mall, you're going to perhaps make sure that the, the entrances and exits are, are monitored by people and you're going to make sure that there's not ways to get into the building you know, through some back door or something that people aren't monitoring. Um, for example, that happened in my, when I went to high school that um, some, somebody just came into the building and, and attacked one of the students 
And so the school's response was to then make sure and seal off all the other entrances except the two main ones, and they had people standing there watching and making sure they knew everybody who was coming and going. Okay, so if you were in a high crime area, that's what they would do. And so there would be firms who would specialize in producing personnel, providing personnel that were trained in security, okay, and they would perhaps have sophisticated body armor depending on the danger of the assignment, and they would be trained in, to be courteous and so forth. And obviously, if the people who work for a certain firm are rude to customers or when they take down, you know, someone's, um, some 15-year-old kid shoplifting and the, the owner of the store says to the guy that he's hired, oh, hey, you know, take him down, and the guy goes and just beats the crap out of the kid, and he's 15, and he was stealing, you know, a CD or something. Well, that's not good for business either. All right, so we would expect, in contrast to the treatment that government police affords to people and to criminals and, and suspects, that there would be much more humane treatment, much more courteous behavior on the part of these personnel if they were provided by competing agencies. Okay, because, and that's... Um, I think a, a crucial point that a lot of people don't realize is that when the police do things like, you know, sodomize someone with a broom handle or they um, shoot somebody, what was it, 41 times because he was holding up a wallet and they thought it was a gun and things like that. And it's, on the one hand, it's very depressing that there's not an outrage on the part of the community that, you know, I can't believe the society I live in that these people don't care that the police are doing this to people. But on the other hand, I think that's because there's the government monopoly, that people really do think, well, yeah, occasionally that stuff happens, but you know, we need police. And so if the choice in these people's minds is between police who occasionally brutalize suspects and so forth, or you know, what they think is of anarchy, chaos, well, then they're going to say, well, the police are a necessary evil. And so, but if, if, if they realize that, no, there are competing firms, and it's not a choice between do we want to have security personnel or not, but rather do we want to keep going to a store that patronizes this company who, you know, the newspaper has said that there have been three cases like this in the last year, whereas this other company, and they've been running ads on TV pointing this fact out, that their, their personnel have never been accused of harassing customers and so forth. Well, then I'm going to give my business to some competing jewelry store because they hire the personnel from the more reputable um, security agency. All right, so I, I just w do think that the natural um, consumer inclination to patronize businesses where the people aren't acting brutally would be able to manifest itself, whereas if there's a government monopoly, you might get the appearance that, um, that the citizens don't care, but I think they really do care. Just to give you um, another example of that, I was... Um, in Long Island when the, the Puerto Rican Day Parade happened, and if, if you don't know what that was. So every year there was this Puerto Rican Day Parade, and one year there was some, um, some angry youths started uh, rioting and going around, and they were just like literally you know, grabbing women and ripping their clothes off and things like that, and they were just going nuts running around. And so this one girl escaped... You know, she had been, I think she was rollerblading or something, and they attacked her. And um, there was a good Samaritan who, you know, came in and said, like, grab onto me. And he pulled her out of, you know, just a, a group of guys groping her and, and let her out of the crowd and dropped her off somewhere. And so she, here, and she's looking around, and other women are still being attacked as this is happening. And so she, of course, what do you do? Oh, you've got to go call the police, right, or get the police, and they're going to save the day. So she ran and saw two police officers sitting on steps somewhere, like at some building, and she's, you know, going nuts. Like, hey, there's, there's women being attacked. You know, go do something. Call somebody. And she said they didn't even stand up, let alone did they rush off to the scene and throw themselves in the, the line of fire. And, um, and the reason, it, well, this is, uh, this is a conspiracy theory now, but I think the reason they didn't do that was because the police had just gotten in trouble for some ruling about the, I think it was the um, Abner Louima case with the, the thing with the broom handle. I think that if I'm not getting mixed up, that the cops who were, um, what happened there was there was this guy brought into custody, and I think he resisted arrest, and so the police were mad at him. And then they had him in the bathroom and, and took a broom handle. And so those cops got in trouble. Like, so they had gone to trial and whatever, and a few of them got in trouble. And so 
the, the unofficial thing that I heard was that the police during the Puerto Rican Day Parade thing were going to send a signal that, oh, okay, you're not going to trust us. Well, then let's see how you guys like it if we don't do anything. Okay, and so that they were, and the way the police officially defended it was to say, look, you know, make up your mind that one cop said, um, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, meaning, look, we've been trying to crack down on these criminals, and then you got mad at us for sticking a broom handle up that guy, and then now, you know, so we don't do that, and then now this woman's complaining because we didn't stand up when other women were being attacked. Make up your mind. Okay, that's, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. That was, <laughs> right. So anyway, that was, um, I was, I was still naive at that point, and I'm, probably still naive right now, but um, that was a, an eye-opener for me. That It was inconceivable to me that there could be, because, you know, my cousin was going to, was trying to be in the police force, and so, I mean, I know these type of guys, and they're not minions of Satan or anything, and, you know, when you go in and become a cop, it's because you want to help people and so forth, and it, it was inconceivable to me, and especially um, with the race angle, that there would be, and, you know, not that this makes it right around, but just to talk about reality, I couldn't believe that white cops would be sitting there and be told that white women were being attacked by black teenagers and being groped and that they didn't just instinctively want to go, you know, beat the crap out of them. I just, I was surprised that that, that happened. So, um, anyway, so this, in, in case you, you really haven't, it's, it's not an isolated thing, whereas I used to think that when I was younger, but no, I mean, it, it really is the case that this monopoly institution, they, they have no incentive to respond and provide services to consumers. Oh, but anyway, my point of going into that anecdote was even though New Yorkers didn't rise up and stop paying their taxes and, you know, start picketing police officers and when, when cops walked into restaurants, it's not like they said, oh, we don't serve you because of the Puerto Rican Day Parade. That's, that clearly didn't happen. And so you might have thought, taken away from that situation, that, oh, New Yorkers are callous and they don't, and they're morons. But, but really, it was just, well, what choice did they have? What are you going to do? Are you going to change your vote? based on the incidents of the Puerto Rican Day Parade and try to vote for a different mayor and, and, you know, in the hopes that 10 years from now things will be different. No, it's the way the system is rigged. There's really nothing you can do except complain, say, oh, isn't that a shame the next day at the office? And then that's, that's really the end of it. Whereas if they were competing firms, it would not be the choice of security or not. It would be, well, who was in charge of security at that event? Well, that company's dead. You know, that's going to go out of business overnight. Okay. Uh, let's see, just a few other things that you might not have normally been thinking of in, in terms of how I think the government police are actually um, far less responsive to consumer welfare and the very things that they're supposed to be doing. So we, we can talk about brutality and so forth that, you know, bringing people into custody or shooting people and it turns out that they're the wrong people or they weren't armed. Things like there are, I'm sure you've heard these horror stories about drug raids where the, the cops get a, a tip that, you know, oh, somebody's a coke dealer and they go with the literally jackbooted thugs and kick in his door and go in there and then it turns out to be some senior citizen woman and she has a heart attack just from seeing all these guys coming with a gun and then the you know, police say, oh, sorry. And, um, you know, things like that, that would, would happen much less frequently if you really would get in trouble for doing stuff like that. Because right now when the police do, do things like that, Sure, it's embarrassing, and it's not like the the police chief thinks that's great. And he's like, "Oh man, Jesse Jackson's going to be going nuts for the next two weeks about this." And you know, it's not it's not good. They get in trouble, but it's not nearly as bad as if you were a competing firm and you did something comparable. Um, another issue is things like high speed car chases. Okay, you see the stuff on cops where the you know the helicopters found them, and there's you know, someone swerving and going into oncoming traffic and things like that. And I think almost, I think that just about all those cases, that stuff would not happen in an anarcho-capitalist society because um, the, just the danger that that's imposing by, by chasing that person and making him swerve into oncoming traffic on the highway and things like that, that you're really, you know, just whatever the guy did, you say, oh, well, if he's a murderer, okay, but if some, you know, SUV with five little kids goes off the road because of that, well then right there you've just you know, done more damage than you were supposedly trying to prevent. So I think what would happen in a, an anarcho-capitalist world is they would have more helicopters and things like that, and so rather than chasing the person, they would just have more agents out and they would have a better coordinated response. And so if they knew somebody's on I-95 going north and the helicopter would follow him and just radio ahead and then whatever the, the um, 
you know, the toll collection checkpoints or so forth, however the, the road's being financed, then they would just not let the person through, okay, rather than chasing him and making him a cornered animal and, and doing whatever he needs to to try to get away. Okay, so things like that. Um, another issue is the, the response time. All right, that again, when I was younger, I just had this conception. I used to be really afraid of people, uh, burglars breaking in. And I had this idea that you certainly get from watching certain types of movies that, oh, yeah, someone's breaking in. You're going to hear someone you know, jiggling your door. Not, you call 911, and the cops are going to be there in 20 seconds. You know? And that's certainly not the case, especially if you live in a, um, an area that's what we call economically depressed and with people of color, that the, the police don't care. They don't go out there. And again, it's, um, and I've talked with um, black students at NYU who are very, you know, leftist. And of course, their explanation for all this is, oh yeah, because the police are racist. And, you know, maybe many of the police officers are in fact racist, but just in terms of a more in argument from incentives, why would the police send cruisers out there where they might get shot or whatever, you know, take a long time to re or respond quickly while the criminals might actually be there, and it, because it's it's risky. I mean, you might lose an officer or so forth, or you got to have more people on staff and ready to go. And what's the what's the downside from not doing that? Are those people going to make an, change your budget somehow? These people who don't even vote probably and have no political pull whatsoever. No. So they just in terms of the cost and benefits. There's no reason the police are going to respond quickly to a 911 from some area out in the hood. Whereas if in a nice, rich suburban area where the people, you know, it's uh, politicians live there or some important judge or so forth, and he thinks someone's breaking in, well, the police are going to respond much more quickly. All right, so if you're familiar with the actual behavior of police agencies as under government, I think there are lots of things that you might not normally think of that would actually be much better if there were competing firms. Okay, another major issue is uh, prisons. And Dan D'Amico has done a lot of work in this area, so if you're interested in this, you could talk to him. I haven't read his papers, but just talking with him, it seems like he's touching on a lot of these issues. So one thing you've got to be careful about is people... T um, what happens right now is governments are... They're strapped for cash, and so what they do in order to save money sometimes is they'll privatize the prison. Okay, so they'll either, so they'll let an outside private agency come in and just run the thing, and they'll take away the you know government personnel and just subcontract. Or, or um, I'm not even sure. Maybe you can Dan can clarify in the Q and A. Um, they might even just outright let some firm actually build the prison and design it from scratch and so forth. And so it really is. A sort of private thing. And what happens is there's a lot of scandal involved with these prisons, these so-called private prisons, and the, the natural explanation from somebody who, who is sort of a uh, knee-jerk reaction against market forces is to say, well, yeah, look at, the, look at these people. They're concerned about the bottom line, and so why would, they, um, why would they pay to have more guards so that in case there's a riot, they can, you know, just go around and, and use non-lethal force to, to quell the riot, whereas if it's just, you know, five guys with 200 inmates going nuts, well, then the five guys have no choice but to shoot them to restore order, okay? And so, you know, the, so the argument is, oh, the profit motive is bad to introduce into this area because the, the prisoners are just going to cut corners to save money. They're going to hire fewer people, and they're going to do things so we would expect this sort of horrendous outcomes, and they, there are documented examples of things that have happened in, pri in privatized prisons that are um, th undesirable. But what's happening there is it's who is still right now the, the client or the customer of these private prisons? It's the government. Okay, So the government is the one who is paying these firms to maintain a prison and to house inmates that the government has declared. These people are criminals. You take care of them and we'll pay you such and such per prisoner or whatever, depending on what their, their outcomes are. And so if the, if the client, if the customer is not going to penalize you heavily, you know, if, if the government doesn't have a rule saying, okay, we're going to pay you this much, but if, by the way, if, you ever, if it's ever found out that you have um, allowed prisoners to be, to be raped by other inmates under your supposed care, 
well, then we're going to fine you $50,000 as a penalty. Okay, if the government's not building that into the, the contract, well, then, yeah, why would the, why would the prison, the, the, the firm running the prison, it would have no incentive to, um, you know, separate the really violent criminals from the ones who are just, you know, white-collar criminals and the, or, you know, really scrawny guys who you just know, oh, if we threw this guy to the general population, he would, he would be dead. You know, there's... It, it takes extra money to, you know, watch out for those things and to try to prevent it. And so, yeah, if the government, as the as the customer, isn't going to be paying more for that enhanced level of service, well, then yeah, it it would be stupid as the if all you care about is profit to to do that. But that wouldn't be the case if the clients weren't monopoly governments who, for reasons that we can't get into, but obviously are less concerned about human welfare and so forth. But rather, they were. Um, smaller decentralized units, and again, we can't be too specific right now about well, who would be paying for prison services because then we'd have to go into well, who do we think is, is making the, the laws and so forth. So I can't get into that there, but you can at least see how the real problem with so-called privatization of prisons is that really it's just outsourcing it and it being an appendage of the state. It's not really um, taking prison out of the government sphere and, and handing it over to the private sector. Okay, so I touched on the, how the treatment of prisoners, I think, would be much better under a, a private system. Again, again, because it's just, it's unprofessional. If you've got, if your business is to house inmates, all right, and, and there's riots or things like that, or it comes out that your guards were, were abusing them, or that, as I say, you know, it's just known that there's no oversight in other prisoners, really, you know, haze and so forth, the other prisoners, that's just unprofessional. And, I think in a competing system that those firms would quickly go out of business. Another major issue is that right now, people in prisons, the inmates, it's just a complete waste of their labor. All right? They just sit there playing cards, lifting weights, doing whatever. I mean, the, the joke, okay, they make license plates or, or they might do, go pick up trash on the highway. I mean, if you've ever driven by and seen you know, 20 guys in the orange jumpsuits and some, you know, sometimes they've got the you know, all their legs are shackled together and there's a couple guys with guns sitting there watching them and they're going around picking up paper, all right? Now, if you just think about how absolutely wasteful that is from an economic point of view, that there's 20 perfectly healthy individuals there and they're picking up litter and not only, so we got to pay for the two guards to sit there with the gun, we got to pay for the van that took them out there and so forth. And then there's always the chance that they're going to escape, okay? I mean, if... If you just think about it, that's, that's an inconceivably stupid way to utilize the labor that's, that's available. All right? And so under a private system, of course, pe firms interested in the bottom line. And again, it would depend on what the, what the legal system was. So I can't be too specific because from a certain point of view, I mean, if you talk to uh, fairly radical people, they're going to say, oh, well, if you're a criminal, you know, if you're convicted of a crime, then you're a slave and they can make you do whatever, okay, and I, I personally don't think it would be quite like that. But in any event, you can certainly see how, for example, if an accountant is convicted of a, of a crime and he's supposed to go to jail for two years, all right, it would be quite silly to take him and, and take him out and have him pick up litter, okay? He could still be an accountant in jail, and you say, oh, well, we don't want to reward him for his crime. Well, okay, he could not get that money, or maybe it would be garnished and would go to the, to the victim or what have you, but clearly... It's silly to be using these people in, in tasks that are um, very inefficient. Okay, another issue is, the, is parole. All right, and so what happens under a government system, and you, you read these horror stories, and the way it really hit home with me is I, I used to be interested in, you know, how does the, how does the FBI track these serial killers? Okay, because, you, you know, people start turning up dead, and there's the same M.O., and then, you know, the, oh, we have three suspects or we have a suspect and whatever. And, the guy, and I just always used to wonder, well, how do they do that? And so I used to read, um, you know, true crime things about explaining, oh, they came in and he saw that the body was placed this way. And then they started checking the mental institution, things like that. And it was just amazing that one of the reasons they can catch these people is because they have a, a criminal record, okay, that they were, you know, oh, yeah, he molested a boy back in 84. And then he did it again in 87. And then he did it again in 89. So that's why we think it's him. And, um, and, and it's just what you're reading. I said, well, if he did all that, why is he back on the street? And so what happens under the government system is they're just letting out people that, 
from you know uh, just a common sense viewpoint really ought to be kept off the streets and so that sort of thing would not happen under a an anarcho-capitalist system and again we can't be too specific about well who would be let in and who wouldn't be because um, we would need to then talk about the how, the how the legal system is determined but just to show you what what I was doing in this book the, the vision I was taking is that at least in a, in a highly developed um, urban area I think that in order for you to get into a mall to shop or to, to live in an apartment or to get a bank loan things like that that you would need to be have some other group vouch for you okay so people would be members of voluntary organizations or associations and so the idea is so that one company and it, it might even be you know like a, a union or something like that like in terms of the people you work with but in any event what they're saying is okay our members if any of them ever wrongs you according to the established you know arbitrators that we all trust and he doesn't pay you he skips town then we'll make good on his debts okay so that you know and, and why would why would you why would this group do that so that if you're uncertain when you're meeting somebody to, whether to do business with them or not you can be assured if they flash their card and say oh look I'm a member of whatever this the, the benevolence association then you can say oh, okay I know even if this guy does something bad and, and skips town I'm not going to be out fifty thousand dollars because they're going to pay me off okay and so then why does how does the association make its money well it charges dues okay so its members pay dues and and then of course the the way it, it makes a profit overall is that it only lets in people that it thinks aren't going to commit crimes or rather they assess the likelihood and then they charge you an appropriate due perhaps okay and there's we can imagine all sorts of different variations and I'm sure there'd be groups that would specialize in certain things or not so given that I think that when somebody when somebody as um, let's say somebody goes out and just and shoots 20 people okay and then the, I mean, he's caught on videotape doing that and the police come and they capture him and so now the issue is okay which which associations are gonna vouch for this guy well not many okay that no one's gonna say yes if this guy you know feel free to let him walk through your mall and so forth or, or rent a room and any any harm he causes we will make good on nobody's gonna do that because the guy's crazy he just went out and shot 20 people but what somebody might say is okay I will um, provide a the, the secure building and I will vouch for this guy so long as you deliver him to my into my custody okay and then you would sign contracts with this uh, serial killer or whatever and say okay look we're gonna agree you're gonna live within these walls and so forth and then of course you would and then he would say fine and he, you would sign up so it would all be contractual and of course you would make sure when you design this thing that the guy's not going to be able to escape into the general population because you are pledging to everybody look this guy is now I'm vouching for him if he kills anybody from this point on I'm liable all right so it's going to be in your interest to um, to to keep him from escaping but the thing is you're not going to then get him and be able to punish him and whip him and so forth because other agencies could make him a similar deal so there would be competition among prisoners for inmates all right and so that's um, because the the function of the prison is to keep them out of the general population, all right. And so, but but so long as that's done, if it's met those objectives, then there's no harm in letting the prisoners pick among buildings and, and firms that you know everybody else knows. Okay, yeah, you're not going to escape, but you can go to wherever you want because the point is just to get you out of general population. So that's what I think would happen under a private system. And then, of course this issue of rehabilitation and so forth if somebody really is reformed and so forth then the the person who is vouching for him could say alright if you pay us higher dues then you know feel free to go out in the general population And if you make it for three or four years and you haven't committed crimes maybe then we'll lower your premiums to be a member of our association and so forth alright whereas now when you when you when it comes up for the possibility of parole you go before a table of, I'm sure you've seen movies like this, and they interview you, and they, people have wacky psychological theories as to recidivism and so forth, and as long as you know how to lie your way through the thing, you can get out, all right? And, and why does that happen? Because there's no, there's no accountability. That if you're some crazy psychologist and you have a weird theory as to what causes crime, and there's this serial rapist who comes up and you say, yep, I think we should let him out, and then he commits five more crimes, nothing happens to you, okay? So... Um, that's why I think this issue of parole, you can see how that would be handled much better under a private system. 
All right, let me stop there and ask it, or take time. When, when did this start? Did it start at 11 to 15? Oh, okay. I, can let me, I thought it was going to end at 11. Okay, let me go. I have two more points, and then I'll open up for questions. Okay. Um, just in terms of the incentives, another issue, and this, again, this isn't an Austrian point, but this is more of a, uh, a public choice type of argument, that the police, you, might, you have this conception that, oh, the police want to prevent crime. And really, if you think about it, if you get cynical and assume that the police really are out to maximize their budgets and so forth and their job security, it's not really in their interest to prevent crime. What the police really want to do is to arrest criminals. Okay, that's what makes a police department look effective. That's the way you, you maximize your budget. Because suppose, just to, to give you an example, um, I was reading how this innovative sheriff in some, some uh, town in, in Florida he found out that, okay, so there was these guys doing, doing drug deals on a certain corner, and all he had to do to get rid of that was just to put a cop standing there. And then, okay, you know, one's going to be doing dr deals in the plain sight of the police officer. Okay, but in terms of if that sheriff then wanted to justify his, his budget to, to his higher-ups, you know, they could look and say, well, that officer's not arresting anybody, okay, and they would just look at his aggregate statistics, and, and, it, and it wouldn't look like he was getting um, many convictions for his man manpower hours and so forth. Whereas some other sheriff who instead of doing that and really getting rid of the drug dealing in plain sight then just had agents sitting in an unmarked vehicle and watching the deals go down and then people were walking and then went up and, and busted the guy, okay, then those guys would have a conviction and it would look like, oh, we're really cracking down. Now, of course, drug dealing and so forth wouldn't be illegal under an anarcho-capitalist system, but I'm just illustrating the point. Or just another idea or another example if the police could somehow eliminate homicides in a city, and so year after year there was never any, any homicides, and it was really due to the fact that the police were doing something different, um, you can imagine under a government system that maybe their budget would be cut because they would say, well, look, there's no crime in your area, and so what do you need all these officers for? Okay, whereas if, if year after year the police are arresting all sorts of criminals, then they can say, we need more officers because um, look, at, look at how we're fighting this war on crime. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is the calculation problem. And if you remember, I think it was Dr. Salerno's lecture, just in general, and, so, and this is the specific <laughs> Austrian point, that what's the problem with socialism? Well, yes, it's the issue of incentives, and that kind of goes hand in hand with what I just talked about, that in practice, why would people behave altruistically or the way that they say they're going to if you look at their actual incentives? But then there's the more fundamental calculation problem that even if the planners and even if the, the plant managers and so forth, the comrades under socialism really did want to do their best to implement the grand plan, they simply wouldn't know what's the best way to allocate our resources to produce goods and services. And you have a comparable problem when it comes to government provision of security services that since it's not private citizens who are paying on the margin for particular services or not, it's just people are all being collectively taxed a bunch of money is then allocated to police, and that's divvied up, not based necessarily on merit, but on political considerations. The tie between output and consumer satisfaction and um, performance is, is severed. And so even if we put aside our cynicism and so forth and say, oh, I know a lot of guys who became cops and they're jerks and so forth, which I do, incidentally, um, even if we put that, put that aside, it's, and the police honestly did want to you know, say, okay, I have 1,000 officers at my disposal and, and 17 squad cars, and, you know, and I have this budget. And the issue is, well, how should I spend it? Should I hire more officers and have them out on patrol? Should I hire more um, horses so that like during parades and stuff, if you've seen in big cities, you know, the cops are going around on horses and things like that. Is that effective? Should they be going around in terms of partners? Or should they be going around in terms of threes and fours or just individual agents, you know, how many undercover and so forth? All these, ish, all these matters are determined largely through just arbitrary uh, po the political decisions. Okay? Whereas under a market system, if you really did have a profit and loss test, and you could say, you could really say, okay, because we arrested this guy, our client paid us $5,000 as a bounty. Okay, whereas right now the police don't have on the margin any sort of feedback for what is the, the gain from doing this particular action of police work versus this. Okay, and so I think the, 
for any given amount of police resources, they would be allocated much more effectively under a private system. And again, that's just because of the calculation problem. All right, I guess I could stop for questions now. Sure. Okay. Um, my somewhat question is a, is a comment that I think you remember that in a lot of these cases, we would actually be better off from the status quo with actually nothing. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Say if you live in the ghetto, in mm -hmm. a lot of cities, it would actually be better that the police just didn't exist because most of what they do there is arrest people for, you know, selling drugs, etc. Thus decimating the community and also, you know, arresting people for selling drugs basically spurs on street crime. So, you know, it's actually detrimental. There, there's no positive good coming out of their work. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think public schools too, especially in inner cities, are just breeding grounds for, for crime and that if we didn't have public schools that that would, or I should say government schools, a lot of people don't think you should concede that it's public. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, what do you think like, um, uh, I think that's down with <laughs> uh, think about it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we've already gotten rewarded for private uh, security and the fact that in my homeowner, if I have a security system, mm -hmm. I get a substantial deep street on my homeowner. Mm -hmm. And I think you would expand that, like you're required to have a, say, a firearm and know how to use it. They don't get discount for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, issue of insurance, I didn't touch on that because it's a big topic and also my views aren't necessarily the uh, ones universally held by other people presenting here and so I don't want to get into it because you know Mises University is supposed to be sort of a you know this is what we all agree on I don't want to raise controversial points but if you if you read any of these books especially um, Rothbard or, or my chaos theory it's the insurance industry that's really going to sort of be the one providing the financing for this stuff so if you want to think yes there are people who are willing to pay for defense services or security services and there are individuals who are certainly happy to provide it and now how are these people going to actually be interconnected how are we going to get the money from the consumers to the to the providers i personally think that insurance companies would play a major role in that yes no i'll go you yeah. i'm guessing this private area that you don't want to get into on that but i'm just wondering how that uh goes with the professor hoppers lecture yesterday on insurable acts and uninsurable acts. But it sounds like primarily what you're talking about falls mainly into his category of uninsurable acts. Right, well, since you forced me into the controversy, um, yeah, that's, that's precisely what the issue is. So in, um, in chaos theory, what I, what I talk about is, and it goes with, with these associations, so yes, when you're, in a sense, you could look at it and say that, um, people that there's an the insurer is saying okay what's the chance this guy's going to commit a crime and we're going to charge an appropriate premium but the the objection to that sort of thing and, and people have told me that no I'm I'm confused in this this issue you're talking about is that look you can't insure for individuals you can't say okay I I want to take out a policy on this guy committing a crime or not because that is it's an individual thing and it's not insurable whereas you can say, I as a business, I'm going to take out insurance policy against people committing crimes against me, in which case I'll be you know, paid off to compensate because we can look at aggregate statistics and so forth and see what are the, what are the chances that I'm going to um, have someone break in. Um, it's, I would have to get into the technicalities of it, but just to give you a quick answer, I, I understand the, the idea, the difference between insurable and uninsurable, but I think if you really pushed it, the strict definition, nothing would be an insurable risk under that approach. Because even, you know, the, the you say, okay, well, you know, you could, it's insurable or it's, it's a risk to say if I throw a die, it's going to come up, you know, what's the chance it's going to come up? One, you can talk about that. But then to say, okay, fire insurance, it's not really the same. You can't really say that, oh, there's a 2% chance that this house is going to burn down. And you say, okay, it's a, it's a class of all houses and so on and so forth. But that's really, um, I think, involves just as much entrepreneurial judgment as me saying, what is the chance that this guy is going to go kill somebody? It's a difference of degree. I don't think it's qualitatively different. Yeah. Um, two quick points. One is that I think most of the faculty here have been, have been including in their talks things that are their particular views that are not shared by all the faculty. Mm -hmm. So 
to worry about squeezing yourself into a knowledge box. But um, on the issue of uh, whether this sort of uh, insurability is practical, there are historical examples um, in uh, medieval England, in early medieval England, before the Roman conquest, uh, over the past year, um, there were organizations, mutual assurance organizations, where people would belong to them, and uh, the reason they worked, and this is precisely for the, the, the sort of thing that um, uh, that Mr. Hopper was pointing out, is that you can in, you can insure more easily against things that might seem uninsurable if you're more able to monitor closely people's behavior. So these were some fairly small groups where they they would know you. It wouldn't be just like you know, signing up with some massive insurance company. But they'd know you personally. The other people would uh, would sign up to hold themselves responsible for your wrongdoings, if any, you know, uh, in exchange for your signing up to you know, contribute your share for any of theirs. So the idea was you know, a bunch of you know, a bunch of people get together, and if one of them gets um, gets in some sort of legal trouble, the other people uh, will uh, will help out, and it's beneficial for all of them as long as they trust each other. And if you can't find anyone to, you know, if you serve unreliable, you can't find anyone to trust you, then you're going to have a hard time and people are going to be less willing to sign a contract with you and so forth. So, so that just work pretty well until, uh, until uh, you know, William the Conqueror came. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, conquerors do that. Um, you, you, uh, so one response is yes, uh, that's actually what gave me the idea. It wasn't, it wasn't voluntary, the thing, and I don't remember even where it was, maybe you would know. But it was there's some primitive society where um, when you were born, you were just assigned into like a group of four other individuals, and then it was just understood that you know you were all responsible. And so then the other four would make sh would keep you in line because if you did something stupid, then they would all be liable. I mean, what William actually did is he changed it from a, from a voluntary system to a non-voluntary system. So initially, mm -hmm. he kept the same system, it's just that mm -hmm. everyone had to join one and they couldn't kick, and they couldn't kick people out anymore. Of course that wrecked the system. Right, right. Um, but yeah, before that it was it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was voluntary. You could choose whether to join one or not, and they could choose whether mm -hmm. to accept you or not. And the other thing that you reminded me of, going back to your question, for example, um, I think if you took the, dis the distinction between insurable and uninsurable, you would have to say the chance of Liberace getting his fingers chopped off is an uninsurable risk. And yet he did have a policy from an insurance company that said if this happens, we will pay you such and such money, and you pay us um, regular payments for this policy. And so if you want to say, well, that's not really insurance, okay, fine, but there's something that certainly looks like insurance, and whatever and that thing the is. The likelihood that he would chop his fingers off to get the payments was sufficiently low that it felt safe. And right. Any, uh, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, like, on that, uh, the insurance thing you're talking about, you know, and you're, you're insure um, yourself, I mean, UK insurance premiums to sort of a voucher agency, that wouldn't really be um, insuring yourself. You're really insuring the people that you're going to visit uh, against the possibility of you committing a crime. So there's not this perverse incentive there because you're not getting rewarded for committing a crime. You know, and also if you did that, then the voucher company would have a, a case against you. But I had a question about um, yeah. about like what happens when you have someone like a rapist or a serial killer who goes out and rapes or kills like you know 20 or 30 people. Um, you know, but how, how is punishment um, dealt with in a kind of ethical society? Because you have, maybe maybe you know, different victims want different things, which happen to be incompatible. You know, the, the total punishment is more than can possibly be given on this guy because he's dead, you know, or, you know, he doesn't have enough arms to give, or, you know, who knows what. So what, what's your opinion on that? So it's not a 20-armed serial rapist. No. Okay. <laughs> just want to clarify the example. Um, depending on which person you read, the answer would be different. Um, so Kinsella and Rothbard would say the, the whole two teeth for a tooth, and I think what you're alluding to is, okay, well, you know, if he's killed 40 people, we can't, you know, kill him 80 times. Um, I, the, the way I see it, it would be people would start out with sort of intuitive gut reactions that people know murder is wrong and people know that yeah you can't walk up to a little kid and just start punching him for no reason um, <laughs> right and that that just then people signing contracts and forming agreements and so forth on the basis of those pretty widespread universal opinions of morality would foster a legal system that would not 
necessarily be strictly to do so it wouldn't be that there would be judges sitting around who say okay I'm going to assume that you know there's scarcity I'm going to do this this and, that, and then derive the whole body of law through logical deduction I don't that's not the way I see an actual legal system operating and just sort of answer your question it would depend on what the people in that area so the guy who is doing all this stuff even to get into the property in the first place he's either literally or implicitly agreed to whatever the rules are and so there could be something like okay if you come into our community then you're agreeing if, if you you know kill 10 people that we then get to keep you in jail for 50 years or that we get to torture you on national television okay and so <laughs> and so if there's some really harsh um, punitive people that where they say if you um, you know speak look the wrong way at a woman we get to chop your hand off and maybe there are you know certain um, religious groups that would, would think something like that or if you get caught um, using drugs then you, you get your arm chopped off or whatever is they could sign contract and they could just all be part of the tenant agreement but then of course other people would just make sure okay I'm not going over there all right and so um, people say oh that's like ethical relativism but I don't I don't think so because it's that's like saying you could get paid a hundred thousand dollars from this employer or fifty thousand from that one and it's not uh, a retreat to relativism to say that you know you go to the place where you want to that it's not really nobody's saying that I ah, yes that's a objective morality and this is a different objective morality and so forth it's just saying well they all agreed to it and so if your moral system allows for voluntary pledges and agreements then that's that's fine so that's the way I would try to get get around answering your question all right I think I need to stop thanks